I'm Kate Green, and I'm here to tell you that your code will die in a fire. But I'm also here to tell you that there are ways to make it less likely and make it easier to recover when it happens. I have a lot of years of experience in software engineering, and I have learned amongst the many, many bugs that I've shipped in my career, don't tell anybody, that there are ways to make it a little less awful when it actually happens. So I wanna share some of the things that I've learned, some of the things that others do to make it both less likely and also recover quick, more quickly. So the first part is knowing what you're making. The next part is knowing the, what, where you're making it. And the last thing is knowing when it's on fire and defensively creating things like logs and monitoring so you can find out perhaps before anybody else does. And a funny caveat, as I was working through the production here um, and in preparing for my talk, I realized that these same principles apply to teaching my little boys who have spent a lot of times at campfires here in the Northern Hemisphere winter, that these same principles apply to teaching them to be safe around fire. So the first thing that you need to be thinking about is what you're creating. The, the summary of this slide should really be what I wrote at the bottom, demolish as much ambiguity as possible. Our jobs as software engineers is to take a people problem, which is usually involving lots of messy steps, things that might happen or might not, and asking a computer, which has no flexibility whatsoever to help us execute these, these uh, things. So, our job is to take a messy human problem and, turn, and turn it into something that ones and zeros can handle. So that's kind of the summary, but what does that include? That includes working with either your product org or whoever is helping you to figure out what you're building. You need to know what your inputs and outputs are, like what are, what are people submitting to you that you need to then process? Uh, what is the user flows? What are, you know, how are people working through your application? How are they gonna be using it? And then, and then use your head there because you need to be thinking about the ways that all users will use it because you have to think about people using keyboards instead of mice or screen readers, or you know, maybe they're colorblind. There's a lot of places that the user flows that you expect to work, users don't do it that way. If you've ever done user research, <laughs> users do some things that you will never ever expect. So not only is it the happy path, you know, you're, you're, you're 80%, but you have to kind of dive into the, the, the other 20% of use cases. Just have them in your head because that's part of writing defensive code. And then think about the places where your code is depending on other parts of your application and also what is depending on you. So understanding where things are coming in and going out and what you're, what you're um, you know, like where these interdependencies are will help you to, um, to deal with any issues that, that, that come from those kinds of dependencies. So that's the first part. And then once you kind of, when you have, have a sense of, of what you're building and, and you've covered every angle that you can think of, you need to think about how this is going to fail. And that includes, well, includes all, everything. Like, do you, <laughs> what are you gonna do when the, when the user you know, bangs on the on, on buttons over and over and over again. How are you going to work on, you know, like that's going to happen. So how are we going to plan for that? Um, how, when it does error, you need to think about two ways. You need to think about logs for yourself or your teammates who will be debugging this for you when you're on vacation, because it will always fall down on vacation when you're on vacation and you'd rather them take care of it than you. But you also need to think about the users. So if it's, if it's say a login script, you know, like you're building a login script for your website, you don't want to tell your users that it's, you know, like that they got their password wrong because that's a security violation. You know, you, you don't want to tell them exactly what they got wrong in that case, but you do want to tell them that the login failed and it was because of something they did and not something on our side, on, on the code side. But then on the back, back end, we can write logs differently. We can, we can be more detailed about the problem log the user ID, those kinds of things. The answers to how things fail will help you determine methods to verify correctness, which is a really fancy way of saying how you're gonna test it, how you're gonna handle error handling, 
So what the, where, where we're going to be worrying about here is trying to catch every possible error and be descriptive to yourself on the back end, but also descriptive to your users, and then generating logs so that you can understand what's going on when you both when it fails, but also you can use logging and then things like mixed panel and stuff for user research further down the line. Although that's only a tangential, you know, um, a true tangential thing that you can do. So that's the first thing. We need to know what we're building, how it's going to fall down. From there, we need to think about the environment. And when I'm thinking about the environment, I'm thinking about the code, but I'm also thinking about the place that you're working, the people you're working with, and also how the application itself works, the entire thing. Because on the technical side, if your code is super stable and you're expected to fail cleanly in every possibility, every, every way, then it's, you know, you're gonna to have to be much more careful in how you write your code. So you need to understand where the bar is on failures and how it's, how it's handled. The other thing that you need to be thinking about in this play in on the technical side is like how you write how you write your your logs, how you deal with failures. You know, there, there's usually standards in places. And if you're brand new, you're not going to know these. This is a great way to get to know people, right? Like go ask the questions, figure out how the logs are are, are disseminated, how you write them, you know, is there any standards on that? If there's not, this is a great time for you to determine how how it should be to make it easier for you down the line. And if you've already been there, you already know this, cool, you're set. But this is, a, this is a place that you can help to bring up the quality of the entire code base as well, if that's needed. And then on the human side, well, let's start, let's start with the, the application itself, the application as a whole. My first thing is, is failure tolerance. I talked about it already. Something like the Apollo project, that better fail right. And well, the truth was it didn't fail well. And they actually had a big problem as the, the lunar lander was coming down that they were then able to fix in subsequent um, launches. But because they, weren't, they were failing out numbers for the astronauts to send down to mission control, that's a big problem. But now we've learned and we're, we're failing in a better way to give users useful information. So in that case, we really should be very careful about how we're, we're doing our errors. And then there's on the other side, where it, if you're at a seed stage startup or any other place that they really don't care, or my side project, mazemonster.com, I, I didn't build a lot of error handling because it runs right in your browser. Refresh the page. If you nuke my site, I don't care. It's your browser anyway. So I, my error handling is not strong and I made a conscious choice to do that. So there's two ends of the spectrum and you need to think about where your application is and what the expectations are for you. The other thing is thinking about how customers use it on, like use the application on the whole, because you're thinking, if you're thinking about the feature, you've already done this and you already kind of know where you exist in the world, but you also need to think about the use cases overall and understand like, like how, how your feature fits in, understand the usual use case patterns, those kinds of things um, that helps you to understand like what you're building in the bigger picture. Um, and then the last thing in this area is thinking about your team. This kind of thing comprises, well, when you go on vacation and it breaks, because it will, making sure that your team is able to debug it so they don't have to call you because you don't want to be called on your vacation. But there's also things like, how do you communicate questions? How do you, com how do you communicate like documentation? Um, you know, what are, what are the standards around working with the people around you? And that's going to help you to, to understand how to write defensive code and how the standards are within the group so that you can share context across the team. And then the next part is knowing your stuff's on fire. And there's two aspects of this. There is actually digging in on some of the stuff we already talked about, which is verifying correctness. And then also writing out your logging and monitoring. So we're doing stuff before we're shipping that's is going to help us to then deal with it when it breaks after we ship. So first thing is verifying correctness. And verifying correctness is not only testing, and that's why I broaden the category a bit. So you're thinking about system modeling. If you're in a place where you're doing stuff that has like a high, a high, no, low tolerance, 
for failure, you're going to want to do something like system modeling, which is using TLA plus or alloy, which are, are two of the big, big languages that, that do this to model out the system and make sure that, that what you are building works before you build it. Um, the next thing you should check it out. It's very, it's a really neat paradigm and it's, it's super important when there's a low failure tolerance. The next thing is verifying types in your non-compiled languages. So, so I'm a JavaScripter and I'm used to having to unit test, type check like on runtime and then write, write my unit test to make sure that I know what it's going to do when it sends me some, you know, weird fal falsy value that, you know, like I can't handle, or, you know, I need to make sure I'm checking all of those. So I've taken a liking to like TypeScript, but that this is also a problem or could be a problem in Python. So thinking about making sure you're checking your types will also help you at runtime to not have it fall over. And then the last thing is actually testing. This is writing your unit tests, understanding which test types to pick, knowing that you need to isolate dependencies and, and test those little functions, but then building in like other parts of the system to make sure that those places you can't isolate is tested. And actually we've been talking about this a lot at my job lately because we have a heavy layer of integration tests and less on the unit side. And I tend to be more of a unit tester. I like to isolate my stuff at the unit, unit level because when I bring in more dependencies, I find it harder to debug. So we've been talking about opportunities because I, I, we're shipping code every, you know, pretty often. I can't ask them to re, redo the entire test stack underneath of our end-to-end -end layer. I just, I can't. So we're looking for opportunities to bring things down and isolate them so that we can test them, test each function a little bit more discreetly. So there, there is, there's some negotiation in there and it may be that, that your code base really isn't able to be isolated because of how the code's written right now. In which case you have to do your best with, with integration level testing or end-to-end -end testing, which that's a hard one. If you can't test below like your API layer, it's gonna be a lot more challenging for you to debug and a lot more challenging for you to, um, to deal with the problems because it's, you're only gonna get application layer instead of being able to dig down into the layers of your system, down into your units or you know, down to your functions and methods um, and classes. So thinking about where to, where to choose tests, that's a whole nother talk. Actually, I think I've, <laughs> I've done it for Sauce Labs, just enough automated testing. It's a webinar I did last fall. Um, <laughs> so go check that out. And that I talk a lot more about this kind of thing, picking the right types of tests, picking the, the, the quick wins, those kinds of things. Um, there's a whole mindset around that as well. Um, so there's that, that's your, that's going to be your next thing. I mean, and then fire mitigation is knowing that your, your code is going to go down. It's going to happen and being ready for it. So envisioning those going back to the first, the first step, how is this thing going to go south? How can we report that? That's getting your logging ready. You know, having your in the authentication scheme, having the user ID ready to go, but oh wait, it needs to be like an, a user ID because we can't have like PII in our logs. So you've got to be got to balance those kinds of things as well. Setting up the the cases in which you need to do monitoring. Usually with monitoring, you're thinking, well, SRE site reliability engineers are generally thinking about like latency and page response times. The things that I generally care about for my code is errors. So is there a spike in errors? Oh my gosh, that's that's a problem. We need to set something up on my service so that I know that there's errors spiking. Okay, would we just release something? Oh yeah, okay, time to go deal with this. And then I go dig into the logs. So that monitoring step is is big. And some places have monitoring, some places don't. Um, I've actually advocated hard to have that at every place I've been because I'd rather catch stuff before a customer does. I'm not interested in somebody coming and waking me up at 1 a.m. because they're angry in like Europe or something. It's just not, <laughs> not my idea of a good time. So I'd rather catch it early and be woken up at or not even woken up at 10 p.m. and getting, getting an alert, which is a good segue. Because the next step here is after shipping. And the biggest part of this whole thing is alerts. 
because we have the logs, we have the monitoring from, from before shipping. We've already done our thinking. We already have our logs set up. We know how it's probably going to go south. We have error handling that catches everything we thought of and then a fallback of, you know, hopefully we have a fallback of like what, we don't know, something happened. It's a 500 error if you're writing, writing um, like API code. <laughs> we don't know what happened. You, you better go have, you better have good logs going. Um, but that's okay because we won't think of everything. And that 500 tells us it is something we haven't thought of yet. So that's, that's the, so we have to, but in order to use logging and monitoring, we have to go look. Alerts give us the next step, which is us being told on the case when errors spike, when there's a certain number of logs that come out that are, that are, that are weird. We can, we can set up alerts on that. Anything where we can get somebody else, something else, not somebody else, hopefully, something else to tell us what's going on and to get us in there early is gonna help us to recover faster and hopefully before anybody notices. So that's what we want to be doing, but there is a something to be aware of, false positives. And this is also true when you're writing tests, to go back to it, to back to tests. Anything where your tests are failing and they're not really, it's a false positive that the test is failing or a false negative. Um, <laughs> anytime that you have anything that's not true, people rely on them less. They start to ignore the alerts. They start to ignore your tests. And then all of your work is for naught. So we need to be very careful when we build alerts that there are things that are really going, really going wrong. So if you have a couple of false alarms, people are gonna start ignoring you. So being, being ready to deal with those false alarms the first time and finding a better way to think about causing those, those alerts is important. So especially if you're doing things where you have people waking up to deal with these. So if you're, you're in a, you know, like a five nines kind of uptime and you know, all, all the uptime ever environment, you've gotta be very, very careful, but that's even the case when you're not in that kind of environment, because as soon as your tests start failing more than five to 10% of the time, anytime you have more than a couple of false positives on your alerts, nobody, you know, it's over. So you've got to be very careful with that. But that's your, that's your best weapon to knowing when something is on fire. So, and then, then after that, you, you should be checking on your logs. You should be checking on your monitoring. It's really hard to keep up on it in our day-to-day, -day, especially as we have to, you know, get, move on to the next thing. We don't get a lot of opportunity to go back and, 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 and monitor these things. So it, we should still be in there. I still do it, but I'm, I'm the kind of person who does. I recommend that anything that you set up, you do keep an eye on, but those alerts are going to set you up the best. All right, so we're here at the end. Here are the things that you need to remember. First, know what you're creating. Demolish that ambiguity. Two, know the environment where you're building things because that's gonna help you to put your stuff in perfectly. Perfectly, because we already know it's gonna die. So we also need to build out all of the things to help us to recover quickly. So let me tell you the kid's story. So all winter, we've all been doing a lot of fires. Um, here in the Northern hemisphere. And my kids are three and five and they wanna play with the fire, but I'm like, okay, we gotta figure out how to make this work safely. So I'm watching them and I'm like, what am I creating? Okay, creating little kids who like to play with fire. So I need to set the ground rules, like ambiguity. You can do this, you can't do this. You can, you can, mostly you can, because they're little kids and they don't wanna be told no. And I'm thinking, what's the environment? And I'm looking around, I'm like, okay, can they trip on anything? Is everything too, is everything far enough away that if we, we have any sparks fly, trouble um, giving them the right stick so that it's, you know, so it's not too short, not too long. Um, and then watching them <laughs> like a hawk, right? This is, this is now, is everything on fire? No, it was, it actually has, it was funny because it turned out okay. They've been through a lot of fires and we haven't had any issues yet. But I'm sure as they get older and more bold, we'll be dealing with it, but I'll be ready. So I'd love to take any questions if any of you have any. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Yeah, 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 yeah